So I've talked to you so far about coherent detection, introducing the possibility of using higher order modulation, and in particular higher order modulation in two dimensions. Before I go any further on how to do the optical implementation of coherent detection, I'd like to just take a few minutes and give you an example of how it is this uh, 2D higher order modulation works. And to do that, I'll take a very simple example, QPSK. And I'll show you how, with QPSK, we actually exploit both amplitude and phase. So QAM modulation, quadrature amplitude modulation, has in its simplest form QPSK. There's also BPSK, binary phase shift keying, but that's 1D. So I'm going to talk to you about 2D. And the simplest 2D QAM modulation is quaternary phase shift keying, also known as Q QPSK. The quaternary refers to 4. So let's take the idea of, QAM, of QPSK modulation. And here I have a data stream, a binary data stream. And you'll see that I've taken and made white for every odd uh, entry in the sequence and red for every even entry in the sequence. And I can think of taking this data stream, this binary data stream, and uh, doing a, a deinterleaving and making two different data streams a data stream for the white, the odd number one, and another data stream for the red, the even numbered ones. And in QAM modulation, we give a, a name to this. And when we deinterleave it, we call this the in phase or quadrature branch. So the in phase or I branch. And the second one is the quadrature or Q branch. So we'll also see uh, this referred to as IQ modulation or QAM modulation, two dimensional in phase and quadrature. Another way that we can interpret mathematically what is going on is not to look at the deinterleaving, which is really useful when we look at implementation. But if we want to talk about how we're going to visualize what's going on with the modulation stream, when we're talking about visualization, then we often instead think of this stream, this binary data stream, being logically broken into units of ordered pairs. So the first two somehow go together in this ordered pair because they occupy the same time slot here in these, these, these um, uh, parallel data streams. The next pair is 1, 0. The next ordered pair is 0, 1, etc. When I interpret this modulation scheme as breaking a binary sequence into ordered pairs, these ordered pairs I refer to as a symbol. And this is quaternary. So if I look here, I have the first symbol, which is the ordered pair 1, 1, then the ordered pair 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. And of course, these first four in this sequence here, they represent the four possible ordered pairs of binary data. And of course, there's four, and that's why we call it quaternary, because there are four symbols in this modulation format. Of course, I start repeating as the sequence gets longer. I'm sending data. And uh, here I start. These four get repeated as they're, they're transmitted. So basically, these are two vocabularies that apply to, to QAM modulation. We can talk about the data streams. We can talk about the I branch and the Q branch. Or we can refer to symbols. So as I mentioned, thinking them as two uh, parallel data streams is good when we want to visualize how this modulation format is being implemented. So we can think of sending these two data streams, the in phase and the quadrature data streams, into two branches of a modulator. So I have a carrier at some frequency that is going to modulate the data. And in one case, it's going to be modulated by cosine and the other by a sine. And of course, cosine and sine are orthogonal to one another, so I'm putting two data streams on two orthogonal waveforms. And I combine the output before it is transmitted over the communications channel. So we call this branch of this hardware implementation the I branch and the Q branch. Now let's go back to the other representation, the symbol representation of QPSK. So if I say there's an I and a Q, an ordered pair, 
when I think about ordered pairs, I think about the Cartesian plane and that I can graph these uh, ordered pairs. So I have now the I and the Q axis. This is now IQ space. I have a two-dimensional space to represent this two-dimensional modulation format. And so now I'm just going to graph these first four possible symbols and represent them in this geometric form. So because there are four possibilities, that's going to give me four points. Now in this case of QPSK modulation, in this case the amplitude happens to be the same for all four symbols. Other quam, that won't be the case, but here it is, one, one amplitude. However, of course, the phase changes. And I could rotate this. It doesn't change the modulation form at all. This is a common way to represent uh, QPSK. Uh, we call this a constellation. It's a collection of symbols. The collection of all of the symbols in the modulation format we call the constellation. This is a constellation diagram for QPSK. So this represents the four possibilities. And of course, if I'm going to transmit a sequence of data, in the end, I'm going to transmit one of these four at a time. So if the first one is logic one, logic one, I can think of them as perhaps a plus one voltage to the cosine and a plus one voltage to the sine. And that would be the symbol representation for this ordered pair. I go to the next ordered pair and perhaps the uh, zero in the Q represents a negative uh, voltage, and so maybe we're going to put it in, in this point, and etc. So I can make the correspondence between these logical values and how I would uh, plot them in a constellation diagram. Of course, the last one, the fifth one, I'm really repeating what was over already here. So it's symbol 1, symbol 2, symbol 3, symbol 4, symbol 2, etc. as the data gets transmitted. So this is the QPSK constellation at the transmitter. There are four values that I send. What happens at the receiver? Well, at the receiver, of course, I have noise. And when I have noise, that means instead of getting one point, I'm going to get points which are just, uh, pushed away from the transmitted value by, by some noise amount. We can sort of see this sort of clustering going on. By the way, we, we call this a scatter plot. All the received data I get, I, I, I plot it so I can have a, a, a view of what's going on in the system. Call that a scatter plot. In this case, in the scatter plot, I can see sort of four clusters going on there. And so my goal at the receiver is, of course, I have to make a decision I have to estimate what was the real symbol that was sent. I didn't get exactly this point, but what am I going to interpret what was received? So this is called the detection strategy. And for QPSK, the de detection strategy is, I look at the four possibilities of what was transmitted. And when I look at one of these received points, I'm going to choose the closest symbol. So if I'm down here, this, of course, is the closest symbol. So I'm not going to, because I get this, choose that one over there. I'm going to choose the closest one. A very intuitive, but also you know, very strong mathematical basis on why this is a good strategy. Now, I can look at QPSK, and it has some nice structure. So I can say, well, basically, there's four quadrants. And these clusters are falling in different quadrants. And so instead of you know, like getting this received point and measuring, is it closer to this one, is it closer to this one, because maybe it'll be near, near here. And instead of making these sort of expensive calculations, what I can do is something very simple, and that's called a threshold test. So now I just look, which quadrant is it in? Is it bigger than zero on this dimension, bigger than zero on this dimension? Okay, then I'm going to make this choice. So detection strategy for QPSK is choosing the closest symbol, but when it comes to actually implementing choose the closest simple, we can do it very low complexity using threshold detection. So remember, there is here the implementation on the transmitter side and the strategy that we discussed on detection.